Miller are planning some kind of TV magic for the Spider-Verse, and we need to know about it. And Joker Man, Joker Man does whatever a Joker can. He doesn't have a theme song, but I'm very excited to keep talking about this movie that has Oscar buzz and festival buzz and all of the hype, and it's all coming, and holy crap, it's a great time to be a comic fan here on Collider Heroes. It is episode 318, and we are joined by the lovely Mark and Draco. I don't know. I wish show. I had one nine hundred of the energy you have. I'm exhausted just sitting here. <laughs> Most are. Most wow. are. I get give it. Us, wow. Give us 15 minutes. You'll be right down on our level. Okay. Well, I'm, uh, and I just had a huge coffee, and I'm still like <laughs> light years behind you. Four hours of sleep, yeah. first coffee of the day, ready to talk Joker and Spider-Man. Let's do it. You Koi, you gotta sleep. One day. This is a giant size shout out. Listen to giant size. <laughs> Koi crime. Sleep Koi. So what do we got on deck today? So I was really excited by both of these bits of news, and it's been a slow news week, but both of these bits of news were giant pieces of what does the future hold for me, and the first of which... We gotta talk Spider-Man because we got a quote out of Lord and Miller. They're doing press for a bunch of their other properties because these guys, much like me, have chosen not to sleep. And <laughs> they are talking about how the live action Spider-Verse show is going to be different. It's gonna be bold. It's like nothing that's ever Shows happened before. Is plural? I, I believe that's what I that's my theory. So go we haven't on. so I'm gonna give you the actual quote, then go into theories. The yeah, actual yeah. quote is uh, from Chris Miller. We are developing a handful of live action shows using Sony's Marvel characters, of which there are like 900 characters. We're figuring out a way to develop the shows so that each are their own unique experience, but are also related. We've been talking a lot of potential teammates for trying to do something not like anything else that's been done on television. It'll be a little while before it all comes together and is on the air, but I think it's going to be something really special, gazoom tight. Hopefully we'll know in the next few months where it'll be and what the schedule will be, and that is all they had to say about that, minus the gazoom tight, because Roka wasn't in the room when they are Questioning. Now, and to translate, the where it'll be uh, on that quote means like what network might be showing it or what streaming service you might be looking at it mm, on. If I was going to start my own streaming service, <laughs> it might be good to have five or six shows from a billion what? dollar franchise. No, a nine Mark, figure deal. A nine figure deal between Lord and Miller and a new network, and everyone else is going Sony to stream it. Sony doesn't have their own network. They and tried it, originals on PlayStation. They did, but that was, you know, that was like cave painting before the printing press. They yeah. were, you know, stuff like Crackle allowed stuff like what we have now to happen. I bet they do it. And I bet they go after something with someone else who doesn't like MGM mm, because they've already co they've already co released some of the James Bond movies and stuff. There's going to be a lot of consolidation, I think. And Sony is the last major player that is still shopping their wares around to different other outlets. So break down that someone who doesn't like MGM bit for me. No, not someone who uh, someone they they could pick up someone someone like MGM. Mm, MGM okay. M MGM has always been in that state of we're almost bankrupt but we still make things occasionally mm -hmm. and they have a great library and to the best of my knowledge they're not linked up with any existing streaming service. And so I you're think saying whatever service I can get Wizard of Oz on, I can also get Spider-Verse on. Wizard of Oz is Warner taste. Brothers. Oh, really? Yeah, there's the, the whole RKO, MGM, all that stuff. They they got all split we up. We need a separate episode. Yeah, they'll be uh, diving into who owns rights Back episodes. Back in the old tiny days, the Nickelodeon. <laughs> <laughs> a post but, but which explanation. Was a thing and not a channel. Yeah. Yeah. But it's something that I think is possibly interesting because Am Amazon's going to base their whole new revamp on Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. Spider Man is certainly just as rich of a property, and they do have 900 characters. And even some of the good ones that got cherry picked, like Cloak and Dagger, first appeared in Spider Man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Kingpin is a Spider Man villain. Yeah. I mean, there's all sorts of, and there's all sorts of subsidiary characters. They don't all have to have a spider in their name to be interesting. Can they build this, like, legally speaking, we don't know, but do we, as far as we know, on these shows, can they build it around a character called Spider-Man, or do they need to do like the movies and build a bunch of stuff that doesn't have him in it around it? I think I think the only thing Sony doesn't control, and I'm this is just my second and third hand stuff, is the animation. They can't they couldn't do like a TV animated series. I thought they for Disney Go. Huh, I okay. thought that was that might have changed for with with Spider Verse, but it, you, there used to be all sorts of there's all these weird loopholes with all these different things. I'm I, pretty sure they've got one more movie with Tom Holland before they can do anything with a character named Spider Man that isn't Tom Holland. I'm pretty sure okay. uh, because he had a six film deal and he's done his three and his two. He's done his three Avengers films and two out of his three Spider Man films. But so I think he's got one more until they can have Spidey back without Marvel's. And Pan as input. far as and we know, we've got. Yeah. Too. <laughs> as far as we know, we've got several more animated films mm -hmm. from this Spider Verse mm -hmm. team uh, come on their way. Right. We've got like a sequel and a Gwen movie, mm -hmm. uh, and we. So so. How long have we known that this TV stuff was going to be live action? That's I the. I think this is. This. That's why this is news. 
Because yeah. a live action show Brain that's explode. a lot of budget and it would be a good flagship and there's 900 characters they mention and I think a lot of the properties they were going to make movies like Silver Sable and Black Cat, The Sinister Six, where else would that belong except for in a streaming service? Funny, Gina prince Blythewood, who was supposed to make the Black and Silver one, did work on Cloak and Dagger, didn't she? Right. I think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. So I think a lot of the properties we heard movies about are now going to be adapted to TV. I think we're going to get an entire Spider-Man shared universe that launches, I love your idea of launching a streaming service. I thought it was going to launch a network. I think it's going to launch a lot of things. And I also think they're, they're probably going to do, they're going to try and race Marvel Studios to the finish line by doing TV shows that tie into the cinematic universe that aren't bastard stepchildren of each other. Right. Because, you know, the stuff that happens in all those shows, WandaVision and all that, are going to be reflected in later movies. They're going to be, that's why Kevin's bringing all that stuff under the same roof. Right. So you could arguably do the same thing. And they're a little bit ahead of the game because they've established there can be as many different Spider-Men as possible. Imagine, like, when they do the crossovers on the WB show, or the CW mm -hmm. shows. Do this. Once a year, have all the shows cross over yeah. with each other. And then they can all exist in their own separate timelines and their own separate, you can have multiple Gwens because they're all individuals. It could be really, really, really exciting. And if there's anybody I trust, it's these guys because this film should not exist i can't believe it ever got Good green got green got a green light. and this is the one time when the population was right everyone right. was right this was an amazing film i've watched this film and i'm in awe of it it captures everything about comic books in fact i would be happy if every live every superhero film from now on was done animated like this because this film was this is going to be studied 100 years from now. This is a deeply, deeply important film. What, I, what I'm intrigued by is I, I'm personally a fan I'm of both live action. Of for that. Live action and animation are important to me, so I want to see this show me that they can do this with those characters. And Lord and Miller, I think, are incredible both live action and now animation. Now I want to see their solo cut. I mean, I've been wanting to since... Uh, I mean, it, we've, all, we've always been wanting to, but now I but really, really want to see it. I'm like... Thank God that happened because this might not have. Right, I, and now wow, that they're at Sony yeah. because of it is we're getting all yeah. of this. We're getting our own web of Spider-Man. <laughs> so I'm really excited to see where they branch out. I'm excited to see that. What they... if the shows are all just the, the way comics just have five different Spidey books going simultaneously? I don't think they're going to do this. But what if it was just like Spectacular Spider-Man, Web of Spider-Man, Peter Parker? Spider <laughs> like I, I just instead of actually making different things, it's just five simultaneous Spidey shows with different different teams on all of them. Yeah, and but the... all in the same universe, not a multiverse. And the same. Untold Tales of Spider-Man, yeah. you get all your what if stuff. Every, oh, this is all canon. This is all on brand. And there's so much source material with Spider-Man because he's had like seven titles at a time for 60 years. And there's lots so much of great characters. And all of his side characters that Sony owns are, a lot of them can be their own spin-offs. A lot of them are very much worthy. Oh, yeah. And with the billion dollars Venom made, they've got some flex to play around with. And can we briefly, I'm sure you touched on this last week, but Andy Serkis doing Venom. Oh, it's yeah. beautiful. You got a guy directing a movie about a CG motion captured thing who is like the Citizen Kane of that doing it. <laughs> yes. Right. And, he, and, and I'm sure he and Tom Hardy know how to know how to party. I can only imagine what the back, backstage is going to be like. I'm the excited. Best. And Michelle Williams just said she wants to be more She-Venom. I'm like, yes, please. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have some Flossy dancing, some Gwen Verdon <laughs> dancing. I'll be, I'll be the happiest gay nerd alive. The crossover I never knew could happen. Flossy, Flossy Venom. Carnage. <laughs> yeah. Yes! Shriek is just bossy. Nice. Uh, now, uh, for me, this was the biggest announcement uh, for a while about live-action Spider-Man because everyone's dreamed about a show that was live-action Spider-Man in one way or another since the 90s. I lived through How one in, in the this? 70s, yeah. And then he came back in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Is Nicholas Hammond in that? Yeah. Oh, well, nice for him. Yeah. Uh, but what do you think about the budgetary restrictions of doing a show? Hey, how is it possible? How do we do this? They I know it's the future. They they're spending $10 million, $12 million on every episode of Game of Thrones. That's true. Fair. Spider-Man's much more bankable. You know, so Spider -Man, planning ahead with short seasons, or at least like you know, cable size seasons, not do do what the British have been seasons. doing forever. Do seasons that are self-contained stories, like Prime Suspect, the old Helen Mirren, Sherlock show. and mm -hmm. Luther. There was progression of the character on each season of that, but they weren't cliffhanger seasons. They were they were five or six hour stories, and do that. I mean, most recently we had that show on HBO from England, Years and Years. Mm -hmm. Sometimes all you need is six hours. Do that, and then you can get good talent because they're not going to be locked down for 22 episodes. You know, they can do six episodes and then go off and do movies and but whatever. But you do want, in this, if they're doing what I think we all mm -hmm. suspect they're doing, which is trying to do a tightly coordinated multi-show TV network, you are going to need people who you can say, like, and pop in for five minutes on this show mm -hmm. and ten minutes on that show. You're going to need that kind Kind of flexibility and that's where your second assistant director earns their money <laughs> yeah <laughs> let's let's organize all these schedules but i think you can do that i mean you see people like meryl streep and nicole kidman and reese witherspoon and jake gyllenhaal now doing tv mm -hmm. because that's where the that's where stories are told now yeah. you know and and if you work their schedules out 
five weeks, almost anybody would do something if they only have to be there for five weeks. I think film is getting more and more blockbuster spectacle for better and worse. And I think TV is where actors get to actually play and where you actually get long form storytelling the way movies were in the 90s and earlier. Which is fascinating to me because when I was a kid, when Bruce Willis got big money for Die Hard, that was a scandal because TV was the, TV was the special ed kid. And right? now it's... And the cool kids were movies. And now everybody wants to be on TV. Because you actually get time to play. Because you actually, for, uh, from an actor, yeah, you get to do things other than say taglines and you know, be opposite a green screen. Quick question, uh, because we're all obsessed with Spider Verse. Any chance all this works out to an actual like live action? At least a few minutes of Lily Tomlin as Aunt May. Oh, I would love that, and I think yes. I, th I think I think if the Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover works mm. critically, I think we'll see potentially a live action Spider Man movie with Toby and with Andrew, Andrew with with maybe Jake Johnson mm -hmm. playing the live action version totally of his could. character. I think we'll see that. I think they're building to that. And it's interesting that there's kind of this, no pun intended for the Spider-Verse, a symbiotic relationship between <laughs> uh, what happens with, with, with the TV universes from DC and the cinematic universes from Marvel. Because DC for on TV really did Established, you can have multiple permutations of a character existing simultaneously. Right. Yeah, and Marvel and you know, Marvel and Sony ran with it and created this genius movie. So it's interesting to see how, even though there's competition, they're, they're forcing, helping train they're forcing the each other to evolve and the mass and, audience yes. to understand the kinds of things that can be done. So that, as we always talk about, comic book fans have lived with this stuff forever, <laughs> um, and we didn't think that you could successfully put this across and have millions of people being like, "Yep, I get it." Crescent. Now my mom bring it knows on. about the Spider Verse, which is insane. <laughs> and to kids me. know about quantum theory. Yeah. Now before we move on to the next subject. Uh, Anything you want to see from a live action or animated Spider-Verse on TV? Any characters you'd love to see pop up? Any weird crossovers like we just mentioned, Toby and Andrew? Gosh, I would love to see Carrion show up. Yeah, I love Carrion. Because he's such a scary zombie. He's like a zombified Green Goblin. Him and Vermin would be um, cool. I would love to see the Green Goblin done correctly. Mm -hmm. You know, I Long form as how you do the Osborne saga. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the Osbournes and the Parkers is, is days of our lives, you know? <laughs> it's the Hortons and the Demeras. I mean, there's that it leans itself toward because comic books are long form. It's a soap opera, and that's the Cl Claremont loved uh, the, the X-Men movies because they got to tell his stories in this long form soap opera, and I think we need that much time for Spider-Man. Yeah. I think TV's the way to do it. What about you? Uh, I would love to see the PS4 Spider-Man show up because Sony owns both, <laughs> and I think if you're doing it, special effects, and if you have animated, you can totally do it. And I'd love to see Alfred Molina voice Superior Spider-Man. Because Doc Ock and Spider-Man be incredible. Oh, one last thing. I okay. want Disney to release on 4K Blu-ray the 67 Spider-Man cartoon series because it's only available on DVD. Yes. Best music ever for a cartoon. And the 94 animated too, please, for both well, of us. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, for me. For me, selfishly. For I, like, I really want a proper live-action Spider-Man series can benefit from so much of what some of the animated series have done so well and really give us time with his life, which mm -hmm. as, like, again, in the comics... Peter Parker and the problems of his life and the soap opera elements of his life and getting and losing jobs, that stuff is built for TV. Yeah. So weirdly, my favorite part about this is that via the absolute wind around um, and, and just obvious fact that there needs to be miles in here somewhere. Of course. Uh, like, if, we, if this is Peter Parker, uh, I'm very excited to see like just a proper live action take on his life, on his incredible supporting cast. Uh, we're seeing these wonderful interpretations of them in on the big screen and in Spider-Verse, but there's so much room there. Like you're talking about, we haven't had a Harry Osborn in years. How about we do a live action Spider-Man TV show that doesn't compete with the movies where it's Peter Parker and MJ are married and have a baby? I would love do, to see Strasinski. Do Spider something, yeah. you know? I would also give me that daily grind coffee shop where they can all hang out. Maybe Ben Riley? Not gonna happen. <laughs> now, this is episode 319 of Collider Heroes, so it's a very important comic episode because it was the first generation X and Uncanny. And as such, this is our comic book pull list. Did you just shout out the Phalanx Covenant? I just shouted out the Joe Mad cover that introduced the madness that started the Phalanx Covenant. Oh my 318's where God, it all began. I'm so I got excited. Wild flashbacks. Uh, <laughs> we're both Gen X people, so it had to be in there. And we don't know what timeline we're in, which is why we're reading Powers of X number two. We're also reading White Trees number one. Event Leviathan number three is out this week. There is a Sparrow Hawk trade paperback. And a second printing of Invisible Woman number one. Now, so we're, we're going to dive into all that in giant size because this might be our first second printing because I am loving Invisible Woman and there's so much good stuff this week which we will definitely dive into, but we have a very special guest and a very special book on this week's pull list. And that is, of course, freaking Supergirl. <laughs> Aw, you guys. I'm if only book. we knew the awesome dude who is writing Supergirl right now. This I is the first volume that came out in April, but the run is ongoing right now. Yep. 
Yep. Uh, I hear the guy that writes it is so in love with himself. Uh, it's really <laughs> annoying. Um, <laughs> Roka, don't confuse me with you. Um, uh, thank you, thank you. I'm having a blast doing this. Uh, I started with issue 21, which is a sort of a jumping on point, because uh, when my, bed, my buddy Brian Bendis, who we've been friends for almost 30 years, which is ridiculous, um, took over Superman and told me his idea. I'm like, oh, what about this for Supergirl? And the whole, they came, it all came together. And I'm getting to work with Kevin McGuire, Legend. So Kevin if you McGuire. if you're a real Kevin, you know, Kevin McGuire's Justice League was so important to me and such a great groundbreaking comic book of its era, um, and to be able to be like friends with him is <laughs> weird. It feels like I'm wearing my dad's suit to work and they're treating me like an adult. Uh, but crypto's in it, you know, as a dog lover, crypto's an important character. But right now the current issues are tying in directly with Superman. We're wrapping up the whole Rogelzar, what really happened to Krypton thing, and leading into an appearance of. I guess I can talk about this since Brian talked about it on Seth Meyers leading into the return of the Legion of Superheroes to the DC yes. Universe. So, and that I've been symbol makes me I've happy been, every time. I've been privy to some of this stuff, and Brian is really firing on all cylinders now. He's, I, I, I don't think I've ever seen him this excited since the birth, since him having kids. I mean, he's so fully in with Superman and, and, and the positivity and future forward and stuff. It's real. I mean, I got goosebumps of talking about this. So it's a real privilege to be able to do that. And I'm very proud of what we've been doing with Supergirl. Um, I had to, I read almost all of her appearances before I started the book and I always try and figure a out. wild ride. Yeah. I mean, it, first world problems, you know, I could be digging ditches. So reading, <laughs> oh, I had to read, I had to read 300 comic books in my underwear. Oh my God. Um, but uh, I was trying to find things from all the different runs that were universal with her because I'm not a big creator. I, I don't like when creators come on books and go like, everything you knew was wrong. I'm throwing mm -hmm. everything out. I think that's kind of arrogant and lazy. There are certain people that can do that and have done that, mm -hmm. but it's become a trope. Uh, so I want to try and find what, what through all these different permutations over the past 80 years or if, yeah, 50, 60 years, maybe 60, 50s, 60 years. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. What are the similarities and what are the differences and how do you make all these characters complementary without mm -hmm. making it all about continuity and minutia? And it's just been a blast. It's been, I, you know. As a comic fan, thank mm -hmm. you for caring because it's really exhausting when someone comes in. They're like, "This is my blankety blank," and you're like, "But this is a part of this tapestry that's gonna yeah, so go on they after nail you." It, and then we're fine with that. There's but... two people that can do that, and their names are Grant Morrison and Alan Moore. Mm -hmm. Really? <laughs> I mean, I mean, if we're gonna be honest about it. But they're both obsessive students of the history of comics. Exactly. So it exactly. kind of comes through. Yes. <laughs> they, they inherently find a way to tie it in, even when they, they think they, they're they not. inherently <laughs> find a way to say everything you knew was wrong, but everything is right. There's a thread going through yeah. it because of them and that's really hard to land yeah. so thank you for caring and i do anything with crypto like yes uh, well, you know he's not a silly character to me i mean I, you know if you've ever owned a pet they're a huge part of your life and and i wanted her by having him in the story i can have her interact with another living creature instead of just interior monologuing and i can have him be sort of almost like a mood ring to her yeah and and dogs are awesome and kevin loves dogs too and it's just you know if you don't like dogs I don't. I don't trust you. So fair. Yeah, it's fair. It's fair yeah. to say if you don't like dogs, this run is not for you. <laughs> Speaking of a character that probably doesn't love dogs, the Joker movie <laughs> is tracking above Shazam, which made a lot of money, and above Aquaman, which made damn near all the money. It is tracking to make between sixty and ninety million domestically, and about seventy-seven million in just three days alone. And this movie cost like the catering budget on most superhero movies. 60 was, to 90 million dollars its first weekend. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Seven, 77 is the three day and 60 oh. to 90 is the range they're looking at, oh. which puts it above the 67.8 Aquaman made and the 53 that uh, that Shazam made. That's insane for a 40 million dollar movie for a 40 million dollar movie that's coming out in the middle of October. Yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy, but you don't get to premiere at the Venice Film Festival unless you got the goods. And they're already talking yeah. awards talk, which we talked yeah. about right before air. And he's actually uh, Joaquin is getting his first award at Venice for Joker. So they've already announced. No, no, it's not. It's not Venice. It's another film festival, I think. At right? Tiff. Oh, oh, Tiff, thank Tiff, you. You're sorry. right. At Tiff, it's opening and competing at Venice. So he's it's at award Venice at Tiff. and the Toronto Film Festival. That's a big deal. That that's a big show of support for this. And I gotta say, you know. You make a movie that's set in New York in the 70s that's, that makes me smell garbage, but PTSD. I mean, <laughs> it, the movie looks like Mean Streets. Mm -hmm. It looks like Taxi Driver. It's wearing its in influences on its sleeve in the best possible way. And he's so weird in real life that I can't wait to see him. I mean, I'm glad he's doing this now because I was excited when there was talk he was going to be Doctor Strange. Yeah. I'm like, oh, exactly, he is. But <laughs> uh, it's a movie I want to see. And now that he's doing this, it just looks, it looks like this is going to be, and we were talking about this, this might be at the first time uh, two actors are nominated for playing for an Oscar playing the same comic book character. Yeah. Because if he gets nominated and he wins, it will be the time that 
someone's won twice, won the same characters won twice with two different actors. And it's a that movie that very can, interesting. I, I hope it breaks the mold of this mm. this this opinion on comic films, not as art films, because this looks like everything a, a, an Oscar film is, and all the festivals have already accepted it. The fact that it's getting an award at TIFF, and we've seen only the trailer for it so far, and the tracking means that it's going to be fan and critically loved, like already. It comes out in October. We already have these kind of tracking numbers. That's insane. The major surprise for me in this story actually was the fact that Aquaman, despite making one jillion dollars, <laughs> did not have that front loaded and opening. Weekend. Well, that's the lovely, that's the lovely of opening in that corridor. You you do thirty million dollars a week for nine weeks, and suddenly you've made a lot of money. Yeah, yeah holiday break. Uh, but uh, it is really interesting. I, it is I, I hadn't realized or sort of done the math on this, but the article uh, in question was talking about that this is the same period point, the same frame uh, as they say as uh, Venom last year. Yeah. So I wonder if it's going to now be that in addition to like a Valentine's Day <laughs> gritty superhero movie every year, we're going to have a like gritty October movie a every Deadpool year. A Deadpool slot and a Venom slot? Yeah. I will very be Because uh, yeah, it's Birds of Prey this year. Oh, that's right. Um, so yeah, I'm... Yeah, Birds of Prey's February. Yeah, yes. you're right. I didn't even think about that. They're, so. they're the like the Valentine's and October dark comic book movie period. And then you've got early know. summer Avengers slot and then you've got late summer. That's incredible. Uh, is Suicide Squad's filming, right? Could, uh, that yes. be, could that possibly be the take its own slot next year? In Oct I can September, see that working October out. I think slot? they're talking about the summer for that, mm -hmm. but maybe if let's see how Joker does. Yeah. Maybe they'll have a new plan. Yeah. And the thing that's great about this, because it's $40 million, it does not have to make $600 million yes. to break even. Right. Yeah. If this crosses $100 million domestic and $100 million overseas and gets great reviews, mm -hmm. Warner Brothers will be over the moon. Anything over that is gravy. And the key there is that what we all hope happens with this film, if it's successful, is not that in, in traditional comic book fashion, if you make one, we want seven more. Um, but this one is, it seems very clearly not supposed to start a six-part Joker series. <laughs> it's supposed to inspire people to make other equally interesting and artistic films. Well, look at how many and different I hope I will. Look at how many different versions of Sherlock Holmes or Dracula sure. or Frankenstein there are. Now these characters aren't public domain yet, but that doesn't mean we can't have multiple versions. Yeah. And I don't think he's I don't think Joaquin Phoenix is the kind of guy that signs for six movies. He wouldn't do Doctor Strange because of the that, number yeah. of films. I can't imagine he did more than one of these. And I hope this doesn't launch six jokers. I hope it launches six black label films. I want a lot of DC yep. making these choices. And I, I think that's want the next. a big budget Gotham by Gaslight directed <laughs> and written by John Logan, who does Penny Dreadful. <laughs> We've got off-screen applause for that. Give me this doing well, and give me Justice League Dark with Guillermo del Toro, who just talked about it again this week. We're just going to talk about in Giant Size Heroes, which drops this Thursday, and that concludes this. And, uh, we will also, on Giant Size, we will be taking a moment to talk about the passing of Ernie Colon, um, oh, which we yes. heard about this week. Uh, uh, if, you have, if you're not familiar with Ernie's art, Ernie did everything from damage control to amethyst to Richie Rich. His last big work was an illustrated version of the 9-11 Commission Report. <laughs> He was one of the most versatile artists. You've every th if you've ever read a superhero comic, you've been touched by him. And if you haven't read his original 12-issue Amethyst series that he drew, go out and find it. It is spectacular stuff. So rest in peace, sir. Thank you for all the artwork. And on that note, until next week, stay sweaty. Stay sweaty.